gentlemen, welcome to Man in America. I'm your host, Seth Holhouse. So right now, everyone's talking about Sound of Freedom, which I've got some shows about that, which you'll be seeing if you haven't already. But there's one movie that I would say was equally as powerful, if not more powerful, but in a different way. And that was Nefarious. And this was put out by Steve Dace. He's part of the Blaze TV team. I think he did it independently, though they had some interaction there. And I have to say, I, I'm I'm a movie critic. My wife is even more of a movie critic. We've watched this film twice. We were absolutely blown away. It's a Christian horror film, which is actually one of the reasons why I didn't watch it in theaters. I thought it's, I don't I don't like horror films, but we had seen some really good reviews about it. I think it was actually a Mike Adams review of it, and we said, okay, let's just give it a chance. And I was absolutely blown away. I mean, it's not only is it one of the best films that I've actually ever seen, but the way it accomplished the goal, I think, of, I would say, almost taking someone who could walk into the theater as an atheist, someone that believes that abortion is good, that you can love whoever you want, that there is no God, and like this is the only film I've ever seen that would come close to taking that person and have them walk out of that theater saying, I need to really reevaluate what my beliefs are because that movie shook me to the core. So I'm going to be interviewing today Steve Dace, who was the original author of the book that then became the movie, and he was very involved in the the movie itself. Uh, But before we get started, I'll go and play a trailer. So I've got about a two-minute trailer to play for you that lines up this movie. So go ahead and enjoy this trailer here. Hello? You should have accepted my offer, James. (laughs) Execution scheduled for 11 p.m. He's trying to convince us he's gone insane and therefore incapable of being executed. I need you to prove he's faking it. Edward? I'm gonna ask you some questions. I'm not Edward. I'm a demon. Demons aren't really a thing. What happened to Edward? We own him. We? (laughs) He's a master manipulator. You have your head so twisted around, you think you're the killer, not him. Give me something to make me believe you. Prove to me you're a demon. It's probably just a coincidence. I want to talk to the real Edward. Makes me do bad things. I can't stop him. I need you to see something. You got a fan. Did the same thing with all his victims. Help me! I'm trying to, Edward, but you have to answer my questions. You have to tell me the truth. It won't let me! It can go away. It can go away. Yes? No. It's starting to happen. Can you feel it, James? Can you feel it? time we tell you exactly what it is that we'd like you to do (laughs) absolutely insane now i'll tell you if you're considering looking at this and you want if you're considering watching and after that trailer you have this thought of maybe it's too evil maybe it's too dark Maybe it's too scary. I would say that it's probably a little bit too scary for younger children, but teenagers and above, they'll be able to handle it. It's a lot more PG than probably most stuff they're seeing today. But it's it's very real, and it accomplishes I what I think is showing you God through showing you the devil, and it's extremely effective. So anyway, folks, we're going to go ahead and dive into this interview with Steve Dace. I hope you enjoy it. Um, make sure you're following me on social media. Make sure you're listening to the podcast as well. Go to your favorite podcast app, searching for Man in America. 
You can also find me on LFA TV on Rumble. It's a great channel with a bunch of really phenomenal shows. And of course, it's my main Rumble channel as well. And if you're watching on YouTube, which this video will go on YouTube because it's not something that has some bad stuff we can't talk about on YouTube. Um, if you're watching only on YouTube, you're missing probably 75% of my content because the majority of my content actually can't go onto YouTube because they're community guidelines. So just make sure you go check out the Rumble channel. So folks, let's dive into this interview with Steve Dace. All right. So Steve, thank you so much for joining me today. It's great to have you on the show. You bet, man. Thank you for having me. So I have watched a lot of Christian movies and I'm, you know, being honest, I'm almost always disappointed. They're either cheesy or the, the jokes aren't very good or the acting's not very good or fundamentally, I, I would say that, that they're really, it's almost like they're movies that are made for a Christian audience. They're not movies that would appeal to a non-Christian audience, let alone an, an atheist audience. Yet my wife and I, after hearing a lot of positive reviews, we sat down recently wa and watched Nefarious, which I know that you wrote the book for and were very involved. And I, I was, I was blown away. We've watched it twice. And not only was it one of the best movies I've ever seen, and I'm not just, you know, kind of kissing up. I'm being, wow. I'm being very honest with that. It was the only movie I've seen that I would say has the potential to take someone who's an atheist and have them walk out of the theater thinking, I need to reevaluate my perspective on my beliefs because that shook me to the core. Well, you just checked a lot of boxes that going back to the first day of storyboarding the movie uh, that we aimed for. Um, we, we made this movie evangelistically. There's a reason that we did not have the demon go head to head with a member of the ministry, a member of the clergy, uh, but someone who kind of represents the secular spirit of the age. Um, because we, we are, we're trying, frankly, to use our film to grab this culture by the throat as it kind of just stares, you know, we're at the lip of the mouth of madness right now, staring into the abyss and deciding, do we want to just dive head first or belly flop in? And we are trying to, with our movie, grab the culture by the proverbial throat, shake it and say, do you truly understand where all of your ideas that you think are progressive and enlightened truly come from? And so we, we wanted our demon to hit a person of the left from the left, the true origin of their worldview, and, and help to figure out who just, who's a sheep and who's a wolf, you know, who doesn't know. They were educated one way, indoctrinated one way in government schools and by pop culture and have not even considered some of these sort of metaphysical truths that previous generations of Americans took for granted. And then who's, who's a wolf? Who's all in on it? Who absolutely is into it? And, um, you know, a sheep doesn't know, a wolf doesn't want to know. And so our movie is very clarifying to that regard. But the number one thing we wanted to do was make a hell of a movie. And we knew if we set out to check boxes and to, and to insert purposefully or contrive this or that, it would get in the way of the movie. We wanted to first and foremost make a great movie. And our filmmakers, directors, uh, Carrie Solomon and Chuck Consulman, I think they, they figured something out with quote unquote low budget filmmaking. We made our film for about, uh, for about $3 million. I think that a lot of times when you make a movie on a modest budget, you, you, have, you have the script of the movie you want to make, and then the realities of the budget cause you to start taking things out or, or scaling things back. But by then, you've already crafted the story you wanted. In this case, Carrie and Chuck knew in advance what their budget was going to be, and so they wrote a script to that budget. And, and that way... They are, they were, their imagination was already constrained by the financial realities that they faced. And within that reality, then they were, they were kind of freed up to, uh, to, to, to write the best story they could. And then I think, you know, you know, they come from the God's not dead pure flicks world. I don't, I'm certainly more grittier and direct. And I think that my, our partnership, I think gave them permission to, to, in terms of tempo, atmosphere, um, to go to places the traditional pure flicks model just wasn't going to tolerate or, or didn't think was, um, you know, worthy of, of being a faith-based or Christian film. And, and so I think that um, my instincts combined with theirs and their experience, I think that collaboration led to kind of the, 
the genre busting film that you were given a chance to see. Got a quick message for you. So folks, thank goodness inflation is going down. Thank you, Biden. But wait, if inflation is going down, then why are food prices going up, energy prices going up, and gas prices going up? Well, because they're lying to us. Imagine that. You see, right now, the real rate of inflation is closer to 25%, not the 5% the White House wants you to believe. You can see this with your own eyes and in your own wallet. What this means is that if you had $100,000 in your savings account just one year ago, today, it's only worth about $75,000 in terms of your actual buying power. Your money is losing value by the day. If you went back to 1920 and you had a $20 bill or a one ounce gold coin, you could walk into a men's clothing store and buy an entire suit, jacket, shoes, pants, belt, everything. But think about it. What would a $20 bill buy you today? Maybe some socks, but an ounce of gold will still buy you that same suit. And this is why I believe that now more than ever, it's a good time to consider transferring at least a portion of your wealth into physical gold and silver, real world assets that have stood the test of time. And for this, I'm confident in recommending Dr. Kirk Elliott. So Kirk has two PhDs and is an incredible Christian patriot who's dedicated to helping you break free from the trap of inflation. You can buy gold and silver directly, even in small amounts, or you can transfer your IRA into physical gold and silver with zero taxes or penalties. So Kirk is who I use. He's who my family and my friends use. And honestly, he's someone I trust completely. And when it comes to your wealth, you need someone that you can trust. So to learn more, open up a new tab right now and go to Gold with Seth dot com or call 720-605-3900 to speak to a real person right now. Kirk Elliott's team will answer all of your questions and take care of you every step of the way. Yeah. And that's what's interesting is that I remember the, the, a lot of the marketing coming out earlier this year and I remember seeing, okay, a Christian horror film. It, it, it kind of, it just, right. I couldn't make sense of it. And I, I, as a kid I, in a high schooler, I loved horror films. I watched all of them. I loved Friday the 13th and all that stuff. But as an adult, I, I despise them. I feel like that they're just, they're evil. They put dark things into your mind. And so I avoid them. And even seeing it was a Christian horror film, I was like, ah, I'll kind of pass on that. But I saw so many really raving reviews. I was like, okay, maybe I'm just going to, it's worth it to go see this. And what's interesting about it is that it shows it, it shows you God through showing you the devil. And that's, that's a really crazy, that's a really, I guess, profound thing because even in my life, you know, I grew up in a very modest kind of Christian Midwestern household. You know, my, my faith was, Oh, we go to church every Sunday and I go to, you know, VBS, you know, as a kid. Right. But it it wasn't until I was actually in college. And when I, I actually, I met this guy that had come out of a labor camp in China and I learned about the tortures that he experienced under communism, that that it, it sent me down this spiral of trying to understand, you know, communism and look into and reading stories about how they tortured people, the psychological torture, cannibalism, you know, under Mao. And, and it was actually, it was through seeing that evil that made me see, made me go through this process of saying, you know what? Evil absolutely exists. These are not just human beings doing that. This is this is demonic, the kind of stuff that they're doing. So that was part of it. But then my response is like, well, what do I do then? Do I just back away or do I have to side against it? Well, it's like, well, if evil exists, then God exists. So I'm going to choose God's side and run at that side like as hard and fast as I can because I've seen the depth of the evil. And I think that, that the film really does a great job of showing that it doesn't make you believe in God through showing you God. It makes you believe in God through showing you the devil and seeing how the devil has his hand in everything that we're seeing in our society, the abortion stuff, the, the woke agenda, the just everything that we're seeing playing out in our society. It, it, it connects it. It's like, oh my goodness. And that's intentional. A lot of times we will let the darkness say to say to us in our sinful state, but we won't accept from the light. We don't think we're worthy of the light. Um, we, sh- we shriek, uh, we, we shirk away from the light. Um, we we want to snuff the light because it convicts us of our own darkness. So in this case, the darkness is what is what ends up convicting people. And, you know, the, the, if, if we were in, a, in another era, 
I might have a different take. I, I might say that we live in an era where people are pretty well up on evil. What they, what they really need to hear more about is the grace and love of God. We're not in that era. Uh, we're in that era where everybody's found their divine buddy. And um, everybody's convinced that everyone else is evil except themselves. Everyone is wise in their own eyes. And so this, this is an era now for some old time religion. And, and people need to hear again. And, and, and I think the modern American church has taken, you know, love your neighbor as you love yourself and has put it on either the same line as love, love, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, or has even put it on the line above that to the point that anything that would offend my neighbor means I'm not loving him. So I don't want to confront him with anything. And so I just accommodate everything. And, and so those were all things that were on our minds as we crafted this story, as the script was being written, is that this is a culture that needs to be confronted yet again with the reality of evil. It has heard every white, fluffy, happy-go-lucky, loving, uh, it's, heard, it's heard all those appeals. It's, it's heard from all the pastors in Hawaiian shirts and pleated khakis. It's, it's heard all that, okay? It, it's rejected it all. And so then it needs to hear, um, you know, it needs to hear from Eve. It needs to hear then, since, since, since everybody's good, and therefore, no one needs a savior. I think people need to be reminded they're not good uh, and that there is evil, that everyone is evil and therefore in need of a savior. Yeah. And one of the points that was made in that also is, is you know, in the conversation between the, the main character, the psychiatrist and, and the, uh, the, the prisoner, right? Say, you know, the, the demon himself, when the, you know, the, the guy, the, the psychiatrist was saying, you know, look like our, our society is so advanced. We have all these things. And and the demon's right. response was so perfect in saying that it's like we have you exactly where you we want you to be. That mm-hmm. you're committing some of those heinous acts of evil, such as abortion, without even realizing it's evil. Like it's one thing to know that it's evil, and like you know the, the satanic church that's doing their satanic ritual abortions. That it's one thing to know that you're doing evil, but you know, the, the road is, you know, the, 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 was it the road to hell is paid in good intentions. And that's so true this day and age that a whole generation, multiple generations have been convinced that actually these good intentions of love everyone, no matter what you can do, whatever you want to, what's well, like, well, where do you draw the line at? Because, you know, back in the seventies, you know, where my mom drew the line is different from where they're drawing the line now. And you can see how the, the, the next line is going to be pedophilia. And they're going to say, well, you know, it, it's, it's all about love. And this is God's love it being expressed through the pedophile. And it, like, you can see that they're already working that in. So I say, I thought this did a good job in really helping to establish that new baseline of like, wow, there is such thing as good and evil. Morality is not subjective. This is where the craftsmanship of the film we made is very important. Otherwise it comes across as, you either roll your eyes, it's polemical, um, it's too much red meat, it's too on the nose, it's too ham-fisted, and, and really only the, the, a, a very fringe of people who already agreed with you will affirm that because it, it affirms them. And this is where the craftsmanship comes into play. Uh, the way Sean Patrick Flannery plays our demon, the menacing, the subtlety, the subtext, um, he makes it believable. And so when he expresses these viewpoints, to you, you sense that this is real. This is seething hatred. And he wants you to know he hates you. He wants you to know this. It is important for him to know that you know he hates you and why. Um, And and, and in in the hands of a lesser actor or someone who frankly wasn't as anointed as he was to play this role, some of these things probably read like some of the the most eye-rolling comments at, at, at the on, on Breitbart's comments section where, yeah, we agree with it, but like no one talks like that. You know what I'm saying? And in this case, um, this all becomes very relevant and hits home very close to home because of the quality of the performances in our film. And then our, our psychiatrist, uh, Jordan Belfi, especially with his facial expressions as the movie goes on, he comes in, he is so cocksure. He is so self-assured. He has all the answers. He's the people we've been waiting for. And you slowly but surely over the course of this 90 minute real time encounter with this demon, you watch him get wrecked. You watch his worldview collapse right before his very eyes. And you see him come in very um, buttoned down, very much in control. And by the end, he's completely lost control because of who he's found out is ultimately in control. 
And so the movie was based on a book that you, you wrote. Um, where, where'd the inspiration come from? What was your drive? Did you intend to write the book first and then make a movie or what was behind this? So I never envisioned that this movie would get made. Um, I wrote the book in nefarious plot on my first trip to Washington, D.C., because there's no better place to be inspired by a demonic takeover of America than Washington, D.C. And I was in the shower and a voice popped into my head and said, this book is dedicated to all the useful idiots out there, especially those of you who had no idea you were being used all this time, for you proved to be the most useful idiots of them all, nefarious. And I thought that's kind of strange, but it ended up being the dedication of the book. And when I got back from doing some appointments there, I started piddling around on my keyboard with what eventually became the introduction that's in the book to this day. And, um, and I patterned it after a screw tape letters, but I wanted to go next level. You know, instead of the, 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 the temptation of us as individuals, what about the takedown of an entire culture? And so I created this character, uh, Lord Nefarious, a high Lord of hell who was re- who was commissioned by the devil with the destruction of the United States of America. And in this book, he lays out why he did it, how he did it, who he did it through, real names, real events, real movements. And he lays it all out in very painstaking detail. And he puts it in a book and publishes it under his own name because the fact that we won't believe it, we'll consider it conspiracy theory or it's silly, is how he'll convince his master, the devil, that his plan has been successful, irrevocable, and they're now ready to move on with the next stage of hell's plan for global dominion with the United States kind of off the board. And um, I, I had a guy that I work with now, I didn't know him at the time, call me out of the blue named Glenn Beck. And uh, he said, like six months after my book came out, hey man, a mutual friend of ours uh, shared your book with me and it blew my mind and I want to have you on my show. And I, of course, didn't want Glenn's 10 million listeners to know about this book I was written, so I turned him down. Actually, I came on the very next day. And uh, driving around Burbank, California that day, was the, a, a guy named Chris Jones, who's one of the producers of uh, for Believe and helped work on a God's Not Dead for Pure Flix. And they were getting ready to start their own uh, independent movie, um, which went on to great success known as Unplanned, about break, which was uh, Abby Johnson's memoir as a whistleblower at Planned Parenthood. And they were looking for their next movie, and they always wanted to do kind of a Frank Peretti style of spiritual horror. And uh, they heard me talking about this book and they all went to the office afterwards, got it on Kindle and it blew them away. And they contacted me the next day offering to buy the movie rights. And we waited for them to get done with Unplanned. And as soon as uh, California reopened from COVID, I went out there to begin the storyboard process. And it took about three years um, from uh, storyboarding to uh, uh, theatrical release in April. We had a lot of spiritual attacks, a lot of attempts to shut the film down to stop us, everything from COVID pneumonia to I had a mysterious bacterial infection that almost killed me. We, we got threatened with a union strike in a right to work state. Um, I mean, just a lot of, and I, and I warned our team from the beginning. I said, hey, you know, go online and watch the making of The Exorcist, watch the making of The Omen, and we're not making a movie that's that graphic. But if you earnestly seek to show the enemy and his motivations for who he is, he doesn't take that lying down, you know, and, and we faced that for several years. On the other hand, God was very faithful to us and opened up a lot of doors for us to get this movie completed and made. And so we watched spiritual warfare play out every day, just about to get this movie done. And um, it was a fight for every movie theater. And now we are having a very successful streaming um, window that we're all very excited about. And I remember, because I follow you on Twitter, and I remember, you know, you know kind of following your chronicle of your this back, this infection that you had that nearly took your life. And so, I mean, I, I meet for me personally, I, I absolutely believe that we're in a spiritual battle and that a lot of times the feeling of sickness or whatever, it, it could literally be a demon that's punching you in the gut that makes you feel like crap when you wake up the next morning because they don't want you to get out there and fight against them. And so what was that like for you? I mean, was it something that you just, you saw like, this is an attack from the evil and I have to stand up strong against it? Or what was that experience like? We have been through so much already to get this movie made that the timing of getting a very rare infection of MRSA of unknown origin, and it happens the very week the movie is coming out, especially because the next week um, I had to go back in the hospital again because I had 
near-death allergic reactions to the medication it took to fight off the MRSA. The, 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 the day I was discharged in the hospital, I got a call from the aforementioned Chris Jones. And he's like, you are not going to believe this. Or no, he texted me. He's like, you're not going to believe this. I was just putting my young son, uh, Jonah, uh, in, his, uh, uh, in his car seat. And an SUV came out of nowhere in this parking lot here and uh, nearly killed me and him, took the door off my car and totaled it. The next day, another one of our producers, John Sullivan, texted me and says, you're not going to believe this. My car was parked outside here at my house in L.A. like it normally is. A nursing student fell asleep driving on a residential street, crashed into it and totaled it. Thankfully, I hadn't gone to work yet, so nobody was in there. I mean, I, I think we lost track of eight different car accidents associated with members of the crew or cast over the course of the making of this film, including bicycle accidents. And I, I mean, <laughs> it, it, it was it was pretty clear what was going on in order to get this movie made, but the Lord was faithful and we persevered. And have you seen any responses specifically from people that have said, I was, I was an atheist or I was really doubting. What are some of the, what are some of those responses looked like? I mean, I've gotten thousands of emails uh, that I have saved and a lot of them are what you described made me really rethink things, made family members. I knew really rethink things helped me reach family members I just couldn't reach on my own. And the way you marketed the film as a horror film, you basically suckered them into, the, into seeing it, which is, was our intent, basically. And they had no idea what they were getting themselves into. And by the time they figured it out, they were just so in, you know, enthralled with the story, they didn't want to turn it off. And, and, and again, those are things we set out to do. I mean, Hollywood has spent 80 years figuring out that it can get away with in assaulting our worldview if we are interested in the story and find the characters interesting. And we set out to just follow that exact same model. You know, Jesus said the children of men are smarter than the children of light. So we just used the same tactic against the enemy that has been used against us. We made a very high quality film. We, we modeled it after Silence of the Lambs, Primal the- Fear, some of the classic, you know, psychological thrillers of the 90s. We went for that temperament, for that tone. And, um, and, and it, it doesn't look at all or, or sound at all like a movie made for $3 million. In fact, I had one of the, one of the highest rated, highest ranking uh, people in the, in the movie industry screen our movie. And his first question after we got done was how much do you make that movie for? And I told him, he said, there's just, that's not possible. A movie cannot look or sound like that for that amount of money. And so those are some of the doors that the Lord opened for us to really get a lot of bang for our buck in our production value, because our intent was Let's just make the most thrilling story we can. And if we, if we capture your imagination while you're in there, you'll let us insult your worldview for a change. So two final questions. This should be easy ones. Sequel and where can people watch the film? Well, that's, uh, they're the same question, answer, actually. You can stream it right now on iTunes, um, Apple, Google, YouTube, uh, Amazon, uh, Roku, Vudu, Salem Now. and if, if this movie is profitable, and we took a big step towards that with how well we've done in our initial streaming phase, then I think you will see some more nefarious uh, content, perhaps a sequel and a prequel, uh, as a matter of fact. Those, those are all conversations that we're having right now. The first thing, though, is we need proof of concept. Everyone know, agrees we have made a, a very good film, one that completely redefines the level of, of quality expected now from faith-based filmmaking. And that's great. But now we have to prove there's a market for it. And the streaming market for this has really taken off and provided all our investors get paid back and their, you know, uh, profit dividend. Then I think it'll be, it won't be as, it won't be as difficult to to get people to go for round two. So we're excited about that. Fantastic. Well, that's actually a a big part of why I'm doing this interview is I want more people to see the film. So for people that are watching or listening, go rent the film share it with your friends and family, invite your family over, don't even tell them what it is. Say this is this awesome new horror film that just came out. It's going to blow your mind. Right. You know, like that's, yep. how, that's how we got to do it. So Steve, thanks again for taking the time to sit down with me today. It's, it's an honor to have you on and, and thank you for what you're doing. This is very important work. Very kind. I really appreciate it. Thank you as well for your time and the recommendation. And uh, let's uh, maybe do this again if we get more nefarious content in the future. Thank great. you. All right, folks, I've got a quick message for you. I have one simple question. 
If today you could no longer go purchase more food for your family, with the food stores that you have in your home, how long would you be able to feed your family? Would it be a week, three weeks, a month, two months, a year? This is a really important question, folks, that we have to be very realistic about because the elites are proactively trying to put us into a state of food crisis and a state of famine. I'm sure you've seen all of the different food processing plants and farms that are blowing up. You've got cattle dying by the tens of thousands. They're proactively trying to collapse our food system because they know if they can control our food, they can control us. And so one of the best ways to be outside of their control is to be able to have our own stores of food and to be able to produce our own food. So there's really two things I would recommend. One is having heirloom seeds that you can grow your own food with, making sure that they're non-GMO heirloom seeds, that that way you can harvest your seeds this year, use them next year. You can use these seeds for generations. Literally, that's how it will work. The other thing, though, is this high-quality storable food. This is food that's sitting somewhere. It's hidden in your basement, buried in your backyard, whatever it is. So that way, if there is a crisis, if there is an emergency, you might have three months set aside to get through that time period. And so for this, I would highly recommend a company called Heaven's Harvest. This is an amazing Christian-owned Patriot company. And what they're doing is they're making high quality, storable food. Again, a lot of the food companies, they say these food buckets, they're all about maximizing calories per dollar. They're filling the buckets with a bunch of filler and junk, like sweet beverages, et cetera. But Heaven's Harvest, they focus on very high quality food that will last up to 25 years on the shelf. They also sell heirloom seeds. You can buy all of your seeds, you can buy all of your storable food. And look, folks, personally, I would recommend having at least three months per person in your household, if not six months or even a year. Again, depends on your budget, but I would definitely make sure you have some seeds because that seed, those seeds could be worth their weight in gold, if not more in the future. So to go ahead and do this right now, go put up a new tab and go to heavensharvest.com. And if you use the promo code Seth, that's S-E-T-H, promo code Seth, you'll save 15% off of your entire order. So again, folks, the time is running out and you'd rather be three months or one year early than one day late. Again, heavensharvest.com and use promo code Seth to save 15% today. 